Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final night of the 2021 Florida College Lectures. We're so glad you could join us this evening. We're going to join in our voices in a moment in song. But first, there were a couple of thank yous we wanted to say as we close out this, lectures, this lectureship unprecedented in so many ways. First, uh, Tom Garland, Bob Wad, David uh, Swisher, and Linda Collette and our army of Parkers, would you please help me recognize their great work this week? Logistics are so difficult, and they've done an amazing job with that. Second, Kelly Mitchell, Judy Bertram, and all of our registration volunteers this year. We had so many of you jump in and help, whereas we normally have students to help. So thank you. <laughs> Sierra Schmidt, our events uh, director, Deborah Brewer, our alumni director, um, our marketing director, Ms. Roxanne Wilson, and all of their crew and support for all the reunions and the organization of this event kind of flow up to them, and it's a lot of work. So please help me thank them for their work tonight. Two more, and then we can quit clapping. Steve and Ladd, our live stream crew, and the AV crew there in the back for making everything run smoothly this week. Thank you, guys. And then, of course, Dr. McClister, who's the chair of our Bible department, and our Bible professors who spend a tremendous amount of time in the planning of these, the preparation, and uh, the publishing of the book. It's a tremendous amount of work. They're here early to make sure that all the speakers are arranged for, and uh, they have been very diligent to make sure uh, that all of this goes over. Please join me in welcoming and, and thanking them for all their work. It takes a lot to put on events like this, and you have been so patient and gracious this week. Thank you so much for joining us, for traveling here, for participating, for engaging with us in some of the most important things that we can think about in, in sharing in the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. What a great blessing it is to be with you. Tonight we're going to join in song with Brother David Lopez here of Temple Terrace, Florida. He's going to be leading us in our singing, and we'll turn the podium over to him. David. Good evening. It's good to be here tonight. Let's sing number Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah.
I love to tell the story. greatest commands.
in Christ alone.
Sing on, ye joyful pilgrims. Sing on, ye
I do have an announcement about this song. Um, the name of Christ uh, is not just in English. Um, it's praised in all languages all throughout the world. And where I serve at North Terrace, we, we have this song in, in English and in Spanish. We also have it uh, bilingual, as you see here. So if you want to call back to your eighth grade Spanish, um, I'll do the pronunciation very quickly because we're not a ton of time. Uh, but it's Cristo, nombre glorioso, precioso Salvador, bello Señor, Emmanuel, Dios con nosotros, palabra viva, mi Jesús. And the second verse is in English, so you should have any trouble with that. Amen is the same in both languages, too. So. <laughs> the soul. So.
All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to the last one then. We've only got one left. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> For you have promised. There we go. I was going to have you stand, but if you had trouble seeing Lorenzo, you'll have trouble seeing me more. <laughs> but let's go ahead and stand. Thank you for joining in so heartily in the singing, and I think, David, in spite of being vertically challenged, you handled that well. Good job of leading us tonight. We've had a wonderful week of singing, haven't we? These are memories you can carry with you for the rest of your life. 
Welcome to our final lecture of the 2021 lectureship built around the theme, Never Has a Man Spoken the Way This Man Speaks. So I'm going to ask you tonight, if you were here last uh, Monday evening for the opening lecture, I'm going to ask you, has this been boom? <laughs> I hope so. And I have an idea it'll be that way again tonight. If we truly listen to the one who spoke like no man ever speaks. This evening, we're pleased to have Brother David Banning to speak to us about the parable of the wise builder and the fool in a lesson entitled, Founded on the Rock. Brother Banning is one of the evangelists working with the Kleinwood Church in Spring, Texas. Before joining the Kleinwood congregation, he preached for churches in Texas, Illinois, Florida, and Alabama. David and his wife, Heidi, who's with us tonight, are both alumni of the class of 85. They have a son, Todd, married to Laura, and a son, Jonathan, married to Leah. Todd's of, of the class of 10. David has done special studies for youth in the U.S. and in Mexico, as well as teacher training classes. His publications include a series of Bible school materials for young people called Getting Them Talking and Tackling the Text, which are available, of course, in our bookstore and have been very useful in the teaching of young people. After we're led in prayer in just a moment by Brother Joe Hammontree, I bid you give David your careful attention as he calls us to hear the beloved parable from the one of whom it was said, Never spake a man like this man. Brother Hammontree. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, to you at this time recognizing you as the creator of this universe, as a giver of every good and perfect gift that, that you have showered down upon us each and every day. We look around us and we see your creation and we are in awe of your might and your majesty. We are in awe of your power. But most of all, Heavenly Father, we are amazed that you, in spite of all of that, have chosen to love us, that you have chosen to, to bless us as you have, that you have chosen to give your only begotten Son, to die for us so we might have hope of eternal life. And it is through him, Heavenly Father, that we are grateful to you that you have given us access into your throne room and, and told us to come boldly before you with our prayers and with our supplications. We are grateful to you, Heavenly Father, for this avenue of prayer. We are grateful for this occasion that we have tonight to come together and to uh, sing songs of praise to your great name. And we are grateful for this opportunity that we have to study uh, with our brother tonight and we pray your blessings will be upon him as he leads us in our thoughts but more than that heavenly father we are grateful for all those who have have spoken this week and for all of the studies that have been done and we pray that the time that we have spent here together uh, has drawn us closer to your son we are grateful for him and for his teaching for truly no man ever spake as he did but heavenly father we pray that that you would help us to always draw closer to him that you would help us to listen to the things that he uh, tells us through your word. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to, to exemplify him in our life in every way that we can. We are thankful for this occasion that we have had this week. We are thankful for this institution that has put, put on this, this lectureship. We are grateful for the men and women who work so hard to uh, not only put forth this event this week, but throughout the year to uh, fulfill their mission of educating young people uh, not only in the, the things of this world but in the things of your word uh, teaching them that you are in control and that you are God and that no matter what role we may play in this life that if we keep you first uh, we will always strive to do the best that we can and to be pleasing in your sight we pray that you would be with this college in fulfilling its mission to educate in the years to come Heavenly Father, as we think back on this past year, we are mindful of the many trials and, and tribulations that we have undergone as, as a nation and as a, in this world. We are thankful that you have brought things as well as you have uh, to this point, and we pray that you would continue to bless us as, as we see light at the end of the tunnel. And as things return back to normal, Heavenly Father, we pray that, that you would continue to help us in that regard and help us to always be grateful to you for the, for the way that you have taken care of us, for the pro provincial care that you have, have given to us, and for the good things that you have showered down upon us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, 
as we continue on through our lives that we will never forget this, the difficulties that we have faced and how it has drawn us not only closer to you, but we pray that it has drawn us closer to each other. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that, that through these trials and through these tribulations that we would learn steadfastness, that we would learn patience, that we would learn faithfulness, and that each and every day we would strive to be closer to you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you watch over and care for many who need your special care. We are all mindful of those who are sick, of those who are struggling, of those who have lost loved ones. And we are grateful that you are a God of healing, that you are a God of compassion, and that you are the God of all comfort. We pray that you would shower down upon each of those that has needs, the blessings that they so earnestly desire, and that you would help us to always do what we can to be an encouragement, to be a strength to those around us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would go with us throughout the remainder of this hour. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins and that each and every day we might strive to glorify and honor you in all that we do. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I was beginning the process a few years ago of trying to sell my house. And so as part of that, I did what I know what some of you guys have done. I, I started walking around the outside, looking at what might need to be painted or caulked or fixed. And, and, and so as I was making my way around the back, the back side of this house I owned, there was this big brick wall that went up. And, and as I, I went around that side of the house, I saw it for the first time. There was this, there was this crack in the mortar between the brick that started low and snaked its way all the way up that wall to the top, and, and I was sick. The house I was living in, it had a foundation problem years before. In fact, it had had a pretty significant repair, and as I'm staring at that crack, I'm, well, I'm seeing dollar signs. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to cost a lot of money to fix, and so... I hired a structural engineer, and he came out, and we were walking around, and he was looking at the kind of stuff he looked at to assess the foundation, and as we were doing that, he said, he said, look, what you need to know about Southeast Texas where we live is that there are only two kinds of houses. There are the houses, y'all know where this is going, right? There are the houses that have foundation problems, and there are the houses that will have foundation problems, which was not comforting at all to me. But he looked it over, and he said the crack was, was superficial, and the foundation was okay, and I was, I was relieved. Foundation's a big deal, folks. It's not the prettiest part of the house. Tim Stevens turned me on to uh, fix it up, fix her upper a few years ago when he was staying at our house. And Heidi and I got hooked. I don't know how many episodes we've watched since then, a lot. But I can tell you, as many as I've watched, I've never heard uh, Gaines say to any of his clients, hey, man, you need to come outside and look at this big hunk of concrete under the house. It's just amazing. You ever heard somebody say that? When we're looking at houses, our eyes are drawn to things like wood floors and granite countertops and stuff like that. But I will tell you. If the foundation is unstable and that problem is left unaddressed, it can, it can destroy all those beautiful things in the house. In fact, it can destroy the house. So now you know why I was talking to a structural engineer about mine. I wanted to stir up your minds about that this evening because in the text we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, he's thinking about foundations too, which is why I wanted us to think about it. Not the kind of foundation that goes underneath a house, but the kind of foundation on which people build their lives. I mean, he's delivered, he's delivered this amazing sermon where he has talked about what kingdom citizenship looks like. And as he, as he begins to conclude the sermon, there is this one last decision to which he, he needs to call his audience and ultimately all of us. And so he does that by telling a story about foundations. 
I think it is one of the most memorable of Jesus' parables, and that may be due in small part to the cool hand gestures that go along with the children's song. I want you guys to know, for about eight weeks, my wife has been pleading with me to begin this lecture by leading everybody in the wise man song, right? And then Buddy gets up Monday night and he talks about how all these unprecedented things are happening this week, and that just added fuel to her fire. Thank you. And while I am loath to ever not take my wife's advice, yeah, I'm not going to do it, okay? We're going to read it. So grab your Bible. This is the end of Matthew chapter 7. I think Ralph's disappointed. He had his, he had his builder all ready to go. Matthew 7, verse 24. Will you read there with me? Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act in them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and and it fell and great was its fall. What I'd like to do together tonight is to invite you to consider with me three pieces of this parable that I think knit together to call the audience to this last great decision that Jesus needs them to make. A great decision, frankly, that we need to make too. So let's look at these three pieces of this story. Let's start with the builders, right? Because that's what our story is about. It's about about men doing what men have always done in every time and in every place. They are building a place to live. They are building houses. That's the story. That's our story. We're all building too. God has allotted to each of us a measure of time and resources to work with. We don't all get the same amount of time or the same quality of resources, but listen, every one of us have been given something to work with. But we don't all build in the same way, do we? Some people are haphazard about their building. They just sort of float through life trying to get through each week to the weekend, right? Along the way, they they squander their resources and and they miss opportunities and along the way exasperate their parents. And yet we know people who are just the opposite of that, right? They are intentional and goal-oriented and focused, determined to take whatever God put in their hands and absolutely make the most of it. It's the kind of people you don't ever want to travel with because first day of vacation, they show up with a spreadsheet. And they've scheduled every hour of every day of the whole vacation, right? It's how they do life. And the rest of us, Well, we're just scattered between the two extremes. But we are all, we're all like the men in the story. We're building. And the Lord weighs in on this construction project. He has something in mind for these materials that he has entrusted to us. In fact, in some ways, that's 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 what the sermon is about, really. How how God wants us to build. And so as we come to the end of it, there is this. There is this decision that still has to be made. And so to call us to that decision, he'll talk about a second key thing in this story I want us to consider. We began with the builders. Let's think next about the foundation. In fact, some way, foundations are the key to the whole thing, right? And it's where our two builders part company. They they build on different foundations. The first builder, we're told, lays his foundation on the rock. In fact, in Luke's telling of this story, he's even more vivid. He says the guy digs deep and lays his foundation on the rock. And I just can feel beads of sweat coming up on my forehead when I read that. I mean, that just sounds like a lot of hard work, a lot of digging to get down to that ledge of stone, and, 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 and he's working on a part of the house that is largely going to be unseen. And yet I think we all get it. We know what he's doing, right? 
He wants to get down to that rock so, so he can put his foundation there. That will make his house stable and secure. That's what he's doing. The other guy's not like that. He chooses to build on the sand. And at, at first glance, that may look like a better choice. It sounds like easier work. No description of deep digging going on there, right? And maybe that means it would have taken, taken him less time. I, I could sort of imagine him finishing first and sitting on the porch in his rocket chair, uh, drinking sweet tea, at, at least if he's in Alabama, and, and watching his neighbor finish up. And when they're done... It may even be that the houses look the same. Now, time was going to tell a different story. And we'll get that, get to that. But, but we need to find ourselves here first because we build like the builders. And like the builders, we also choose a foundation to work on. In fact, that is, that is the point of the whole parable. Jesus wants us to, to choose the right one. And so really, if you want to kind of bring all of this to the key moment, this is it right here. What is the right foundation? What are we supposed to build on? What can we build on that will, will make for a life that will endure and be solid? And what I love about the parable is that Jesus makes life amazingly simple, doesn't he? Verse 24, it is the person who acts on the words of Jesus who is building life on a solid foundation. And verse 26, it is the one who does not act on the word of Jesus who is the fool, who is building a life that is unstable. Isn't it amazing Jesus' capacity to bring life down to this one simple choice? Either we do what he says, or we don't. Those are the only options, and every man chooses one or the other. It is the critical decision at the end of the sermon to be made. Jesus has delivered this magnificent sermon, but what he gets done, or as he gets done, what he says is now. What are you going to do with it? It's not a new idea. Will you back up a little bit in Matthew 7? And look at verse 13. In Matthew 7 and verse 13, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Realize that before there were the two foundations, there were first the two paths. And the paths kind of sound like the foundations. One sounds like an easier way to go than the other. If you look at verse 13, we're told the gate to enter that first path is wide and the path is broad. I love what Stott says about this. He said, this is the road of tolerance and permissiveness and adds it doesn't have any curbs. No boundaries of either thought or conduct. Do you know why people want to go this way? Because they can do what they want to do. It's the life without rules. And the fact that that's how most people go through life just adds to this feeling that it's the way that you ought to go. The easier way to go. The other path didn't like that at all, is it? Verse 14. Kind of like... Digging down to the rock, it sounds harder. Jesus says in verse 14, the gate to enter is small and the way is narrow. You just get the sense it's a harder way to go. People travel this path, they allow God to set boundaries and place limits, and then they, they discipline themselves to adhere to the curbs Jesus put in the road. That's why people don't want to go that way. They want a life without limits. To be able to do what they want to do. It is the better way. It's the more fun way. That's what the world believes. And sometimes we do too. The problem is that when people, when people think that, they have too small a cut of time. They're looking at a, a snapshot and not the broader picture. When you kind of step back a little bit and get the big picture, what you realize is that that broad path down the way, there are some potholes in that road. 
Because grief, brothers and sisters, and suffering are rarely far behind the choice to sin. I think that's why ultimately people who travel the narrow way are happier with their choice. Listen, the great thing about not sinning is you don't get the grief that comes with sinning. But it isn't the more important way to travel that narrow path. Remember, back in verses 13 and 14, Jesus says that these paths have destinations. The broad way is leading to destruction. The narrow way is leading to life. Don't believe the lie that our world is telling us, that there are all these different ways to go, and ultimately they all lead to God. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus said there are only two ways to go through life with two very different destinations. It's simple, brothers and sisters. Heaven or hell, those are the options if we are taking a path to one or the other. I recognize that that rather narrow view of life is going to be offensive to a lot of people. But let's never forget the fact that people are offended doesn't make it any less true. And so Jesus appeals to us in verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. It is life's critical decision. But our efforts to do that are complicated by the presence of other voices. And so if you look at verse 15, Jesus says there, beware of the false prophets. So the false prophets tell us that it doesn't matter which road you travel. They all lead to God. And if that doesn't work, when we start looking for the narrow way, they confuse us about how to find it. And once there, they would try to persuade us that it isn't as restrictive as it appears to be. And so what the Lord will say to us is beware of the false prophets. You need to be very careful about the voices you hear and the teaching you embrace. It occurs to me that there are some important assumptions that lie behind that warning in verse 15 that we shouldn't just pass right over. For example, that warning, beware of the false prophets, necessarily implies that there is such a thing, that false teachers are a real thing. You know, I'm stunned, Ralph, at what I feel like I need to get up and say that I never imagined I would say preaching when I started 35 years ago. But oddly enough, I think we need to say that. That false teachers really are a thing, and we need to be cautious about that, that there are voices out there that are, that are saying what Jesus said and calling us to the narrow way, but they aren't the only voices. There are other voices trying to make us feel comfortable taking the other path that want us to believe it is the right path. It's not a new problem. I mean, even in Jeremiah's day, in Jeremiah 27 and verse 9, he told the people, do not listen to your prophets, for they prophesy a lie to you. Paul warned the Galatian churches in Galatians 1 that there were some who were trying to distort the gospel of Christ. And so it is today. There are voices that distort the gospel. And so Jesus would say, be very careful about the voice you choose to hear and the teaching you choose to embrace. The second assumption that lies behind this warning, beware of the false prophets, is that we, we, we can know who the false ones are. That we can distinguish between what is true and what isn't. This idea, folks, that all truth is subjective and what's true for you may not be true for me, that's just a lie. It isn't so. When Jesus warned us to beware of the false prophet, that necessarily implied that there was a way to know who the false prophet is, to identify him, some objective standard by which to measure him. And there he is. Jesus claimed to be the source of truth. Jesus claimed to provide the only path to the Father, and so he becomes the standard. If we're listening to a voice that agrees with Jesus, we are listening to the truth. And if we're listening to a voice that is in conflict with what Jesus said, we are listening to a lie. And We need to be sure we know the difference, brothers and sisters. Because everything is hanging on this. 
Verse 13 says there's destruction at the end of the broad way. Verse 23 goes on to add that even the very religious who don't obey Jesus, and you can do that, in the end are told to depart. Verse 21 says only those who do the will of the Father enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we need to be cautious about the voices we hear and the teaching we choose to embrace. And so, let's step back for a minute. What do we have here in the latter part of Matthew 7 as Jesus is wrapping up the sermon? I think in essence, Jesus calls us to the same decision just in three different ways or using three different figures. Do you see that? First, there's the figure of the path, a broad way and the narrow way. We've got to choose the right path. And then, and then there are the voices, those who speak truth and those who, who speak lies. And we need to be sure we hear the right voice. And then finally in the parable, it is the two foundations. Do we build on rock or do we build on sand? But I think ultimately the point is the same. Will you do what I said? Will you act on my words? Brothers and sisters, it's vital to get that right. It's vital to get that right because the storm is coming. And that's the third piece that I want us to consider tonight. There were builders, there were foundations, and then finally in the parable there's the storm. You know, foundations aren't the only thing that homeowners in southeast Texas have to worry about. Living along the Gulf Coast in the late summer months, sometimes the simmering waters of the Gulf of Mexico will stir up a hurricane, right? Guys in Florida know all about that just like we do in Texas. In fact, I just say, I have way too much up close and personal experience with hurricanes. I'm done. I've had plenty of that. I'll tell you what a hurricane will do. A hurricane will tell you the truth about a house. And I can testify to that in a very personal way. More than once, I have ridden out a hurricane in a house that was assaulted by hurricane force winds for hours and hours and hours. And I'm very glad tonight to be able to tell you, it withstood the storm. I mean, when all that was over, there would be some limbs in the yard and maybe some fences that were down, but the house was there. But not all of them. I would drive around to the neighborhoods, and there were some places where maybe the homes were very old and not as constructed as well, and on that plot of ground where a house had stood, what there was, I've seen it, was a pile of rubble left behind. The storm, just like in the story, had exposed the truth about the house. They may all look the same before the storm, but it will tell the story. So here's the point. If a builder wants his house to withstand the storm, he has to build for the storm. You see that? That's what, that's what our builder is doing in the story. That first builder who's digging down looking for that ledge of rock to put his foundation on. Why is he doing that? He's thinking about the storm. The fool's not thinking about that at all. He's looking at the sunshine and he is not worried. And we know how that turned out. Okay, Ralph, a little bit of the song. The foolish man's house went. You with me? So I want you to think about that as we make our own decision about a foundation. How we're going to build. We've got to build with an eye toward the storm because, brothers and sisters, they are surely coming. It doesn't seem that way sometimes. You know, there are towns along the Gulf Coast that haven't had hurricanes in years and years and years. And, you know, when that happens, you begin to think, well, they're just not coming here. Oh, don't ever say that. Because they come. And they come for me and you too. There will be financial storms. And I'm grieving with some brothers and sisters who are going through that right now. When COVID hit, they lost their job. They didn't get sent to work at home. They just got sent home. 
and they haven't been able to find other work and months and months and months have gone by and the money's run out and bills have piled up and there are disciples today facing bankruptcy in this mess that happens and there are family storms spouses cheat they destroy trust tear families apart children grow up and leave the Lord devastate their mom and dad their physical storms people we love and care about contract terrible debilitating diseases that linger and inflict suffering and then take life they come for all of us Maybe not you yet, but your time will come too. The interesting thing is that even among disciples, people don't respond to the storms in the same way. Have y'all seen that? I have watched some Christians be afflicted with some terrible, terrible tragedy in their life. And it's as though that tragedy just flooded them over with grief and sorrow and bitterness. And when it was all over, they just walked away from Jesus. They just gave up. And I've seen exactly the opposite happen. I've watched disciples be afflicted with some awful storm, some awful tragedy, and as it flooded into their life, they just grabbed onto Jesus and held on. And when it was all over, their faith was stronger and deeper than before the storm. How do you account for that? Among God's people, such desperately different reactions. I think if we asked the Lord that, he'd say, what you need to do is come out here and, and look underneath the house. It's, it's about the foundation that they were building. It is the person who completely entrusts himself to Jesus. That will be ready when the storm comes. For my family, 2018 was our turn. We'd been like one of those little coastal towns that for decades had been spared. We had, we had been blessed and for years and years we hadn't had any, any tragedy in our life. It began with a phone call on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Greg, I was, I was prepping to come over to San Antonio to preach. So I was in my office collecting my things. My wife was home getting ready for us to go on this little trip. And my phone rang. It was my mother. And she said, listen, I just got a call that they've taken your niece, Emily, to the hospital. And then she said some things about the paramedics trying to resuscitate her at the house. And, and I'm thinking she's mixed up about that. But we were concerned. And so I connected with my wife. We got our stuff together. We piled into the car. And we took off over to Houston to, to check on that situation. And we hadn't gotten out of town. I mean, we just got on the road. And, and the second call came. Telling us that Emily had died. And I know some of you in the crowd are going to understand what I'm about to say. It was one of those messages, one of those calls where it's over, you're thinking, I didn't hear that right. This information can't be true. This can't be right. Listen, listen, Emily was 32 years old, vibrant, healthy, beautiful young woman, three little boys, six, four, and two. Just a few weeks before, my nephew and her had sat in my living room. We had talked up until the wee hours of the morning about all their ambitions for their life spiritually and what they, what they were working on. She had just been credentialed to begin her practice as a, a family therapist so she could help other families who were in need. And now here comes this call that she is dead. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it was the worst storm our family had ever faced. Nothing like it. 
But what we got to see in the days that followed, we navigated those terrible waters, was how God takes care of his people during the storms. I mean, it started immediately. People, when word got out, flooded to the emergency room. I mean, dozens and dozens of people. Y'all been part of gatherings like that where you were, the crowd was so big you were a nuisance. We were. They just built a new wing on the emergency room that wasn't being used there. So they moved us. There were 50 or 60 people at the hospital praying with us and, and hugging us and grieving with us. And then immediately they get phone calls and social media posts and text messages. People saying, what can we do for you? What do you need? And just anything we needed, they supplied. And then the food started. Because y'all know our, how we are about people dying and food, right? And so it just started coming and coming and coming. And, and it got to the point where there wasn't any more place for it in the house. Y'all been there too. And we really needed that. That was, that was important to us. But what was more important is as we began to process what had happened to Emily, we recognized that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And we were sad that now we were going to be apart, but we also knew that it was for a little while. And we began to feel, even in that tragic moment, that anticipation for the grand reunion that is coming for us. And i got to tell you, it just gave us so much peace, gave us such a different perspective on that whole situation. And as I'm going through all of this, again, for the first time, I began to wonder aloud to some of my friends, people who don't have all of this, how do they do this? How do they get through moments like this? And i got to tell you, brothers and sisters, the answer to that question is sometimes they don't. They don't ever fully recover. The grief just overflows and drowns them. And for the rest of their life, they live in the past of this awful tragedy that they never really got over. Let me be crystal clear about something tonight. Building on the sand will get you through the sunny day. but it will leave you totally unprepared for the storms. And they are surely coming. Now, if I'm going to be fair with this text, and I'm wondering if there are some guys in the audience already questioning this, I have to acknowledge that there may be something else or something more that Jesus has in mind when he talks about this storm. So I'm just going to confess to you, I wrestled with this, and I couldn't really decide, so I'm just telling you both, okay? I say that because if you look at this in context, Jesus has been making us think about the end all the way through the latter part of this chapter, hasn't he? Go back to verse 13 and that destruction that's at the end of the Broadway. And then that fire in verse 19 that consumes the bad tree. And then there's that day in verses 22 and 23 where the lawless are told to depart. And, and so you have all of that and you get to the end of this last parable. And, and Jesus talks about this coming storm that exposes every man's building for what it really is. And so I read that and it occurs to me that if that doesn't happen at any other time, when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes, all the veneers are gone. And our building is exposed for what it really is. And maybe what Jesus is saying, it is the one who acts on my words, the one who does what I say. That is the man who is building a life that will stand in the face of that last great storm. So I will leave that to you to ponder and consider whether that's what the Lord has in mind. Or as one of friends said to me, maybe it's all of that. and Maybe he's right. John Stott has written an outstanding book on the Sermon on the Mount. And when he gets to this part of the sermon, he said something that I really like, I want to share. 
He said, the question is not whether we say nice, polite, orthodox, enthusiastic things about Jesus, nor whether we hear his words, listening, studying, pondering, memorizing, until our minds are stuffed full of his teaching. That made me think about lectures. Isn't that what we've done this week? We spent our, our week stuffing our minds full of his teaching. And yet, what Stott is saying is, that's not the more important thing. What is? He says, whether we do what we say and do what we know. In other words, and I really like this. In other words, whether the lordship of Jesus, which we profess, is one of life's major realities. I really like that. I like that in part because it actually carries us beyond the parable to the end of the chapter and and Matthew's concluding comments there. Will you look at verse 28 and 29? Matthew closes the chapter by saying, When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribe. Matthew even gets to the end and says, what is really important here is not what was taught in the sermon, as important as that was. What is more important is the fact that Jesus taught it. In his excellent work on the Sermon on the Mount, Brother Earnhardt picked up that theme. He said, at last, we're not so much confronted with the compelling and challenging message of the great sermon as we are with the person of the preacher himself. He's right about that. In fact, what Matthew said, he said, the crowd seemed to get it. They seemed to sense that there's something different about Jesus. And they even seem to get what it is. He teaches with authority. The question, brothers and sisters, is do we see it? I mean, if somebody came along and suggested to us that Jesus was merely a man, we would protest that, right? I mean, even if they said good things about him, like we think Jesus is a great moral teacher who taught a great moral ethic that everybody should, should consider and live by, we would protest and say, that is not nearly enough. He is so much more than that. But the question is, is he? Is he more than that to me? In Luke's account of the parable, Jesus begins with a question. Luke 6 and verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You know the rest. Do not do what I say. Sometimes our resistance to the teacher should make us question what we really believe about him. He is truly the Lord, brothers and sisters. How can we be so ambivalent about his book? And quibble with what it says. Or twist his words so that they fit what we were already determined to do to start with. If he is Lord, there is only one right response to him. Whatever he says, humble obedience, which brings us back to the parable where Jesus says that it is the man who takes these words and acts on them, who's building a life that will endure and who will be ready to face the last great storm. All week we've been listening to Jesus, like this crowd who heard the Sermon on the Mount. As we come to the end of our week, there is one critical decision left to be made. Will we do what he said? May God help us, brothers and sisters, to build for the storm. Thank you.
Thank you, Brother David, and a powerful amen to all of that. And let us leave with that ringing in our ears. Let him be truly Lord. We have a couple of other things this evening before we're dismissed. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you our academic dean, Dr. John Weaver, who officially began his role at Florida College as academic dean in January of 2020. Already you are feeling sorry for him. <laughs> what a first year and three months he has faced. In spite of the unusual challenges the college has faced in the year of the pandemic, Dr. Weaver has led our faculty with vision, enthusiasm, determination, and much hard work not only to survive, but to thrive and build toward a brighter future. I believe everyone in the Florida College family would tell you that it was God's providential care that sent him to us at such a time as this. Dr. Weaver came to us with 15 years of experience as an administrator in higher education, having served as the head of public service at Emory University in Atlanta, library director at Columbia University in New York, and as well, dean of the library services and educational technologies at Abilene Christian in Abilene, Texas. He has led academic libraries, hired and developed faculty and instructional support services personnel, and served on vitally important academic and curriculum review committees. He holds degrees from the University of Arkansas, a BA in philosophy, from the University of Chicago, an MA in religious studies, from the University of South Carolina, of Master of Library and Informational Services, and from Emory University, a PhD in New Testament and early Christianity. Clearly, he's academically and experientially highly qualified for this role at Florida College. Beyond all of that, John, and I'm calling him John on purpose instead of Dr. Weaver, has also served as an evangelist and a deacon in the Lord's Church. He has traveled as an evangelist to India with Ed Harrell and other preachers for many years. He and his wife, Vivi, the former V.V. Washburn, are both alums of Florida College. John is the grandson of our past president, James R. Cope, through his mother, Kathy Cope Weaver. In short, his roots run very deep at Florida College. He and V.V. have five children. Their eldest is excitedly looking forward to being a freshman with us this fall. I say to you, all of those things together in God's providence brought him to us, we believe, for such a time as this. So I ask you to please give him your careful attention as he gives you an overview of the future direction of the academic program at Florida College. Dr. Weaver. So the future in two minutes, right? Yeah, right. Dave, thank you so much, buddy. Uh, David, speaking of foundations, uh, the foundation of Florida College in many ways is its teaching faculty. And so this summer we will honor six of our faculty, if you can put the slide up now, six of our faculty who retired uh, from teaching at Florida College this past school year. Each of these faculty are legendary, they're legends, renowned for their love for the students, for their excellence in, their class, in the classroom, and, and they'll, be, they'll be deeply missed. Doctors Barler, Atherton, Grieving, Bingham, Chandler, and Dickey, we cannot thank you enough. Will you join me in appreciation? Now, on that foundation is being built a new generation of academic programs and new faculty. And so this coming fall, we're, wel we're grateful to welcome three new academic programs and four new faculty in nursing, marketing, which is a business program, and kinesiology. 
Kinesiology is a discipline that trains students in exercise science, in athletic training, in physical therapy, and occupational therapy. And let me tell you, all of these faculty have sacrificed to come here. They stand in a long line of faculty who sacrificed to come here because of the mission of this place. And they're committed. They're committed, and they have superb academic credentials, deep experience within their fields, and each of them is joined by their spouse and children, which adds even more of the family touch to the FC experience here this next year. And so you can learn more about them and even apply to these new programs on the Florida College homepage. In addition, each, these four faculty will be joined this coming year by eight more new faculty. Some of them are coming in after the retiring faculty, some are entering into new programs, some are coming because of the new nursing program and its growth. And these are faculty names, some of which you will recognize very well, like Dr. Doy Moyer. And they're also alums which are completely new to the college, like Dr. Angela Garcia, who will join Dr. Thaxter Dickey in teaching psychology here at the Florida College. So stay tuned uh, for additional updates and other new faculty coming our way. Also coming our way is a completely renovated chatless library the Library Learning Commons, which will combine old traditional reading rooms, which are completely renovated, with new innovative spaces, learning commons in which students can gather together, connect with each other, with other faculty. They can engage in the new state-of-the-art media studio, which will be there, and enjoy the new cafe in the library. That's right, a new cafe in the library. And so we look forward uh, to that this next year. And so this is just one of several newly renovated academic spaces which will happen over the summer, which along with the activity zone at the, at the center of campus, I think should make next year, our, our, this 75th year, one of the most exciting and innovative in the history of Florida College. And so I want to thank you for your support of FC and welcome you back next year to meet some of these people and to enjoy some of these spaces. So, oh, thank you. thank you. So now to introduce the theme for next year's lecture, I welcome to the podium the chair of the Bible department and the new managing editor of Florida College Press, Dr. David McClister. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us here this week for these wonderful lectures. And I certainly hope that you've been edified and benefited by them as much as I have. I want to thank all the speakers for all the work that they did and the work that they did not only in preparing their lessons but also in presenting them so skillfully. And I want to echo Adam's thanks to everyone here at this school who handled all the details that make a week like this possible. It's truly, truly a wonderful thing. Over 3,000 years ago, an event happened that changed everything. Interestingly, as powerful and as important as this event was, it left virtually no trace in the secular historical records of any nations. Yet, it became arguably the most important event in the history of Israel. Of course, we're talking about the exodus from Egypt. The exodus turned a group of slaves into the people of God. It was proof of the faithfulness of God to his promises. It was a public defeat of a great and arrogant enemy. And it was a type of an even greater rescue to come. And so we invite you to come and be with us for the 2022 Florida College Lectures when we will explore the burning bush, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, the giving of the law, the tabernacle, and many other subjects relating to this crucial moment in the history of God's people. Every facet of this great event says something about Jesus and the people of Jesus. And so please plan to be with us when we study I Brought You Out, the Exodus. Thank you.
So thank you. This series has been brought to a conclusion. I hope you've had a powerfully wonderful week and that you'll carry with you many special and precious memories. And we have a tradition as we close lectureship. We're going to sing the song that has been sung for a long time. And in case you don't know the words, it's supposed to be up here, right? Okay. So let's stand together. We'll sing this song. And following that, our beloved former president, President Emeritus Kali Caldwell, will come lead us in a closing prayer. Be not dismayed. Our good Father, we are so blessed by you to bring us together in this place after having created us and recreated us in Christ. And we're so blessed by him to die for us, to give us life out of his death. And we're so blessed by your Holy Spirit who revealed the truths that we have studied this week. And we pray, our Father, that we will be blessed with the kind of heart going forward to receive these truths. Please bless us all and our loved ones as we leave this place tonight and we go to our homes. We need your blessing now so we can have your blessing in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.